So listen, I, I'm tr- truly grateful for, for your time. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking you first for your service to the teaching community in general, especially yeah. under these circumstances. Uh, teachers must be shouting their gratitude you know, for uh, the free resources you share with them. Um, I, I, and I know you are a full-time teacher uh, and almost full-time parent. Um, I also see that you are an avid uh, biker or bicyclist <laughs> yeah. and, and a nature enthusiast. So tell me, how do you make time for recording your videos? Walk us through the routine of doing all of that in any given week. Uh, well, so there, there, there isn't much of a routine these days because of all the things you just mentioned. Uh, you know, I have, I, have two little, I have two little girls. I have two daughters who are four and two. Uh, so that keeps me busy. And you know, during the school year, the, the videos that I make, I make them primarily as a response to questions that people ask me. And so for that reason, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm going to create next or what I'm going to write about next or what I'm going to record next, because a lot of it just kind of comes to me through my inbox or a colleague down the hall for me will ask me a question. Uh, so you know, that, that's where the, that, that kind of makes it a little bit easier in that I'm just answering questions from people as opposed to trying to think of things on my own all the time. Um, you know, and the videos themselves, I don't do a lot of editing with them. You know, I, I, I try to do them in one take. And if that one take doesn't go well, I just try it again. Uh, that's why they're always short and sweet. You know, I try to keep them three to five minutes and get to the point. Uh, I don't do any of the special effects that a lot of YouTubers do of green screens or, you know, trying to embed little cute things in there. I just go for what do you need to know and, and get it done with? Um, you know, and so most of that happens between three o'clock and five o'clock in the afternoon. And then I, uh, you know, fit in my other, my, uh, you know, my school happens from seven to two for me, mostly. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I get up early. I'm up at 4.30 in the morning, most mornings. Oh, so. boy. And and what about you know your, uh, your your bike riding? Do you do this every day or uh, uh, five five or six days a week? Hmm. So I ride five or six days a week. So the riding happens you know, either right after school and before before uh, before my nanny leaves for the day. My nanny leaves at five o'clock for the day, so you know, I have a have some time there. And weekends, uh, you know, my partner is very helpful, and she. You know, lets me go for rides for a couple of hours on the weekends, and uh, and otherwise I, I I do it in the after my kids go to bed. Uh, you know, my kids are my kids are young, so they go to bed around seven thirty, eight o'clock at night, and I'll work out you know between eight and nine o'clock at night, depending on depending on the day. Uh, so I, I I make it work somehow. I'm I must really admit, sure. you know, uh, although <laughs> um, we have a common passion for. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pursuit of education technology, but, um, you have been my inspiration for bicycling. Well, I was, good. I was never a bicyclist of any kind. Uh, my son has been bugging me forever. You know, dad, you know, I, you know, you need to start bike riding. And I was in you know, a bit of running here and, and walking and all that kind of stuff you know, that goes, you know, with my kind of age range. But, you know, when I saw you, you know, uh, bike riding, I said, man, all right. You know. So I ended up, you know, buying that giant thingy. And, you know, I, I, I ride my giant now. Uh, so I mean, I'm not up there yet, but I'm about, you know, maybe 10 miles maximum. That's the max I can go. <laughs> That, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's one of those things that uh, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. Uh, on the days when I don't go for a bike ride, whether that bike ride's outside or if it's inside on my indoor trainer, on the days that I don't go for a bike ride, I do not have as good a day as the days that I go for a, go for a ride. Uh, oh. Um, and, I mean, on, on the other hand, you know, I mean – this is the outside, but inside my, my office, my, my home office these days is a stationary bike, you know, which I put out in the backyard. And from there I operate, you know, I teach from there. 
um, you know, from my stationary bike. And when I'm in sitting in meetings, I have what they call a walking treadmill, not a running treadmill, a walking treadmill that I bought, you know, from Amazon for probably $300 or something. That has been the best investment. And even my principal has been very kind to me. He's, I told him, you know, even when I'm at school, I need your permission. Give me a small closet somewhere where I could store my uh, walking uh, treadmill and that's where I'll uh, function from. So he gave me that little, you know, space where um, I, I put my computer on, you know, on top of that desk and I walk, you know. So before I get home, I've already walked for about five miles, just, you know, sitting, instead of sitting at the desk, you know, I do walking. Uh, it's very really helpful. Uh, that, that's that's more people need to do that because uh, you know so a couple of years ago I was I was in the worst shape of my life I wasn't in terrible shape but by my by my own standards I wasn't in great shape I just turned forty and I decided I, I had to get back into exercise you know with with you know when you have little kids at home it, everything falls by the wayside if you don't make time for it and I started started doing it again and just being consistent about it and one of the things I, I learned in doing a lot of reading about fitness and you know, talking with uh, talking with some professional athletes um, or retired professional athletes. One of the things I learned is that you know, we don't have to do really super hard workouts all the time as long as we're consistent. You know, as long as we're and, and in many ways we learn we get more benefits from being consistent and doing it five, six, seven days a week at a moderate pace than we do if we just did two or three days of really hard work. Uh, so, it, you know, and, and like I said, for mental health, I think it, that's, that's the biggest thing. It's the, the mental course. health. And, and I can tell you, I think the, uh, the research on, uh, uh, you know, human productivity that also calls for um, having these kind of activities embedded within your routine. If you have to take special time out, you know, for these kind of things, um, naturally you'd take out, you know, for, for mountain bike, biking, you would need to take your time out. But for my kind of a workout that I do, like I said, you know, I'm sitting on the, the stationary bike with a computer in front of me and I'm running a class there. Kids love it. Uh, I'm not spending any extra time on that. Did you, did you see me a little bit of rocking because when I'm doing that, see, you know, probably I'm a DJing or something like that. <laughs> but other than that, you know, this is a great fun. Um, and by the time, you know, I'm done from my work, I've already done my workout too. So work and workout, you know, goes hand in hand. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm glad you brought this up because one of the, you had asked before we started recording uh, about my classroom and I'm, I'm in my classroom right now uh, here in Ox Oxford Hills, Maine. I'm in my classroom. Uh -huh. And one of the things that we have as part of our schedule this year because of COVID-19 is that we, we have mask breaks. Where we have to take the kids out, we need to take the kids outside wow. for ten, at least ten minutes every class period uh, to take their masks off and get outside and get some fresh air. And I, I'm really looking forward to that because I think it's going to be, uh, you know, a really good way to get kids moving to sometimes reset the day. You know, I, I think anyone who's been in the classroom for more than two months knows that. Uh, of course. There are there are days when you just need to reset the classroom, you know, particularly with, with, with teenagers. You know, they, they have so many other things happening in their lives that are distractions. And sometimes you just have to get them outside of the classroom and, and kind of reset and then you know, get 10 minutes of fresh air, come back in and, and try it again. Of so course. I think that's going to be – if there's a hidden benefit somewhere of COVID-19, that might be it, that we get to go exactly. outside – more often. If I may ask, you know, what is the class size, you know, these days, you know, and what, what was the class size before your, before this uh, COVID thing? So school, school wide for my school, an average class is about 22 students. Uh, and this year it's, we're going to have half of the students every other day. Mm -hmm. So your average class is going to have 10 or 11 students on Monday and Wednesday. And then the other half, 10 or 11 students on Tuesday and Thursday. And then they're going to alternate Fridays. So it's an interesting schedule. Uh, and on the days <laughs> that they don't come like into that. school, I'm sorry? 
I said, never seen anything like that. You know, probably, you know, they, these are all new inventions. Remember, we yeah. used to have the modified block schedule, the block schedule and the AB days. And now this is a whole new uh, scheduling um, inventions. There, there are, so I just looked at our, at our schedule. There are eight variables to keep track of on any given day of who's going to be in school. <laughs> oh so it's going to, it's going to be a little tricky, and you know, and the days that students don't come into the classroom, they have to zoom in from home. Ah, and and you are projecting it live. You know, do you have some kind of a camera? Um, and where yeah, is this camera sorry. located? If I may ask, where is that camera located? Where do you have it? So, if you want to take a look at my classroom, where it will be, uh, uh -huh. and my classroom is a little bit different because I teach. Computer, sci computer science, I teach networking and PC repair. Okay. Uh, but my, so for the most part, mine will be, uh, let's see if I can get it, mounted, I'm not sure if you can see the where the hole in the ceiling is. Yeah, 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 I can see that, yeah. yes. So that's where it's gonna drop down from. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I'm oh, wow. gonna mount mine, kind of dropping down from that hole in the ceiling. Uh, We'll see how that goes. And my class is a little bit different because a lot of what I do is hands-on with students. Uh, hmm. there, there are re there's, besides that hole in the ceiling, there are other holes in the ceilings because I have students who are learning how to run Ethernet cable and how to build a network. Uh, and some of that stuff is really hard to do yeah. remotely unless you actually have the equipment at home. Uh, so for that reason, I may end up moving the camera around at different times. Let me, you know, because originally I had thought of, you know, a certain sequence of asking you questions, but I think, you know, this you know, conversation is going so organic. I would rather, you know, you know, just put that the entire sequence in, uh, away and I will, you know, start asking from the question that originally I was supposed to ask at the end. I will ask that first. So okay. I know uh, recently you mentioned about the, the FET simulations. The, the what simulations? The FET, P-H-A-T, FET simulations. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the FET simulations, yeah. Exactly. I think you mentioned about that. And um, couple those simulations with the, uh, the, the advent of uh, AR and VR technology that we have. Um, and, and, and I was, you know, I was one of those who originally, you know, a couple of years ago when someone put, you know, that little uh, VR headset on my, on my, uh, on my head. And I got woozy after some time. But now my son bought uh, a VR headset only uh, a, a month or two months ago. And man, the possibilities and the, the comfort in using technology now, which originally, you know, teachers still probably think, you know, it makes them woozy after some time. But I have seen, you know, what this new technology can do and the potential because, you know, there were some, uh, I think there were some discovery uh, educational resources on that where the people were walking on Mars and all that. So I am seeing the potential of uh, this kind of a technology and especially what you have probably this is a time to experiment with all that when the students who are sitting home, they don't have, you know, those, uh, uh, the, the, the computers in front of them, you know, they, they would want them to you know, pull them apart and show them the, 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 uh, uh, the, the components inside. But I think, you know, the, the simulations and this VR technology can mimic what they can actually see in class. So what is your experience has been so far with those who are sitting home and you are presenting from your classroom? Yeah. So one of the things that I did a lot last spring uh, with simulations uh, came from Tinkercad. Uh, I'm sorry, not Tinkercad, Tinker, T-I-N-K-E-R. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that was really good about that is I had virtual models of exactly what I would have had on my desk, my, my physical desk here at school. Hmm. Uh, and what, what I, so I, what I ended up doing a lot of was just positioning my cameras uh, on my desk, not, you know, that last spring I was doing it from my home office. But mm -hmm. positioning my cameras in my home office so that students could see what I was doing on my on my desktop. Wow! And then I would, you know, and so I do do the model, do the instruction for, 
five to ten minutes, not not long. I, I think one of the things uh, that's going to be really important this coming school year is not talking to kids for an hour at during a Zoom session. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and so I would do five or ten minutes of instruction and say, okay, now you have the virtual tools to use. And I want you to go and make your own models, or I want you to go and, and experiment with X, Y, or Z variables in the in this process and see what happens. And I think that's one of the things we need to do this fall is remember that we wouldn't talk to kids for 60 minutes straight in a high school classroom or a middle school classroom. And goodness knows we would never do that in an elementary school. We wouldn't make them sit for 60 minutes and listen to us. Uh, so we can still do that same model, but one of the things we have to embrace is that there's going to be some moments when we don't know exactly what our students are doing because they're at home. Mm -hmm. And we have to trust a little bit that we've given them some instruction and they now have the opportunity to use you know, whatever virtual model uh, you, you choose for them. Uh, so, one of the, so one of the things I've been saying to people is, you know, Give that five or 10 minute instruction, then give kids something clear to do. Tell them, you know, I want you to try X, Y, or Z, or I want you to experiment with this model, or I want you to experiment with that model. Uh, and then after they've had a little bit of time to try it, then come, ba then come back and say, okay, all right, we, we're going to wrap up with five or 10 minutes. I want you to share your thoughts. I want to stress a certain point. I want to share an observation of, of of what happened here but we really we can't be talking to kids for 60 minutes of over course I think that, that, that naturally brings me to my next question um first of all i insist you know with in this morning also when i was teaching i insist the students to turn their cameras on because um and remember we are also talking about high schoolers here and and this is an alternative high school setting so you know we have you know some of the real you know, strong-headed students in there. <laughs> and, and, and my thing is, you know, you know, it's a courtesy thing. You know, I have my camera on, you know, I'm showing you my entire background. I'm showing you my surroundings. In fact, you know, I, I put the brown, look at this is where I'm sitting. And I usually, because I have my, you know, like a backyard office and I show them around the birds, the trees and all that. And so I, it's a courtesy thing. And 90% of them end up, you know, agreeing. All right, we understand that that, you know, we have to turn it because I cannot talk to walls or those little um, icons or, or letters, you know, for, 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 for that long. So turn your cameras on so that I could talk to real people because I'm big on the, the, the pedagogy of this human interaction. Yeah. You know, if there is no human there, how can I have a human interaction? So I want to have a human in front of me as best as, as, you know, uh, as, as best as, possible, you know, to mimic that kind of, uh, uh, you know, the on-campus setting. So my next question will be, how would you, in a, in a Zoom uh, setting or in a Google setting, how would you encourage student-teacher interaction? What is your technique to encourage student interaction? So the, the biggest technique I, I use is one that I, I actually learned from a, from a a book that I read a couple a few years back called Expert Secrets, which is all about how to structure webinars to engage your audience to get. So, so this can is you tell this about is that I, book one once again. Can you tell the name of that called, book? The book is called Expert Secrets, and it was hmm. written by Russell Brunson, B R U N S O N, hmm. uh, and the book was really about how to structure a webinar in such a way that you get people to respond to your prompts or respond, respond to your calls, calls to actions, what, what, what he calls them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that I, that I encourage people to do and that I've been doing to try to get kids to interact more through Zoom and not just sit back and, you know, and, and take it all in, is to try to embed as many simple questions as possible in the, in the time that I'm, talking to them uh, and that that way they're they're they can be as simple as are you with me or they can be as simple as uh, did you hear what sam wrote in the, did you read what sam wrote in the chat or did you did you 
Did you read what Steve wrote in the chat? Just making those little quick calls to action that don't require you to have any necessary special knowledge can increase the opportunities for students to participate. Right? Uh, and, and it's not a, and they're not questions of, are you paying attention necessarily? Mm -hmm. They're just questions of, I want to point out that somebody, one of your classmates wrote something good in the chat, or I want to point out that one of your classmates raised a good question when they were talking in the breakout room. Uh, doing those little things, those little questions where, you know, even if you don't know the right answer, even if you don't have any specialized knowledge, you can still participate. I think that's going to be really key for a lot of students to to be able to participate in a in a Zoom or in a in a Google Meet. I th uh, I think, uh, excellent reminder of you know the, these are the best practices to uh, for for you know even on campus uh, setting. So um, an excellent reminder of uh, those things. So tell us you know what what lesson building platform would you recommend to achieve that kind of interaction? Uh, I mean we have I mean. And I know uh, you are a great uh, advocate for free or or or, uh, or they call low cost resources. So there are some now, and I and I and I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I'm not for all free or or resources because some of the good resources come you know with some investment. Yeah. And uh, uh, lately, I have started investing my own money also. If if it's making me effective in a classroom. Uh, I would go ahead and, and bought a subscription to things like uh, Nearpod and something like that. So uh, on that, in, in that context, what is the lesson building platform that you would recommend people use? Uh, there, well, there, so there are three products that I use in my classroom. Now I, I teach a mixture of computer science classes. One is a networking class. One is a PC repair class. And one's a, a, a class that on, um, on code on coding, basically an intro to coding, uh, mm. intro to programming course, uh, which covers which covers Python, covers Java, and covers a couple of different languages. It's kind of a catch-all introductory course. There are mm. but there are three products I, I that I use consistently. One is Google Classroom, mm -hmm. uh, and Google Classroom I think is universal in terms of its structure. Right? You can do right. if you didn't have Google Classroom, if you had Microsoft Teams, or if you had Canvas or Schoolology, you can do the exact same thing that I'm that I'm doing, which is I post a few prompts for discussion for thing for kids to think about before they come to class, whether that's in-person class or online class, I have some, some pieces there. Uh, the other, the other tool that I use a lot is Edpuzzle. Hmm. I use Edpuzzle a lot for quick video lessons. Uh, you know, it, whether those are videos that I've recorded or hmm. the videos I've found you know, on YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere else. But I like the, I like having the option with Edpuzzle to embed questions along the timeline mm -hmm. rather than, rather than having students watch a four minute video and then, then at the end, ask a question. I like them to be able to answer something 10 seconds in or 20 seconds in as the question arises. So that's the, I use that tool a lot. And then the other tool that I, that I use a lot is not a free service. Uh, and we talked about this before we started recording. Uh, I use Cisco's Netacad. Hmm. I use Cisco's Netacad a lot uh, in part because of the nature of, uh, of the program that, that I inherited when I, when I took over this, this classroom two years ago. Hmm. Uh, and that it's really designed for 17 and 18 year olds who are, looking to either go immediately into the workforce as an IT technician or looking to go to a community college for further education. Uh, so that's, for what that reason, been, we, in, in, for that in, reason, we use, we use Cisco's Netacad a lot. And, and while we're at it, um, what has been your uh, success level, you know, with the uh, certification, uh, CCNT certification? So, so, so far I am zero for zero. Because we were supposed to do it last spring, and because of our school closing on March 13th, uh, the school decided not to do the exams. Oh, okay. I mean, don't beat yourself because my highest was four. <laughs> that's, okay. that's, that's all. And I'm talking about, you know, out of 700 students. 
<laughs> oh, you know. Yeah. Really- so, so last year we last year we did it. We didn't do the exams, and last year was my first year in this school. So, uh, wow. <laughs> so, so I'm either zero for zero or I'm one hundred for one hundred. I depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you you use uh, one word. You know, when when I was researching for this uh, conversation, uh, you use something back channeling uh, back channels and informal assessment. what is back channels i understand informal assessment too but i couldn't understand back channel what does that mean so really a, a, a back channel is anything you any it's not to be a particular program or software uh, but it's any opportunity that you can provide students to ask questions or share comments informally while class is happening these are the questions that, that, that don't need to be immediately answered, uh-huh. uh, they're the comments that don't need to be immediately addressed, but it's a nice forum for students to be able to, let's say, let's say I have five students working at the other end of my classroom here, and you know, I'm, they're 35, 40 feet away from me, I have five kids working down there, and I have five kids working over here. The five kids that are down there, they might have a question or an observation that they want to share, but they don't need it immediately addressed. Well, having that back channel lets them write, write it out. And then I can respond to it, you know, when I have a, when I have the moment to, to respond to it. Uh, the, but the nice thing about a back channel is they don't have to wait for me. Uh, uh-huh. They can wait, you know, one of their classmates might know the answer and can immediately answer it for them. And or, what applet or widget, you know, would you use for that back channel communication? So there's a tool called Back Channel Chat that I've used. Wow. Okay. Uh, backchannelchat.com uh, mm-hmm. is a good service. There's a you could also do the same thing in Padlet. I've done the same thing in Padlet.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, Padlet has a template for back channels. They actually call it a back channel. Okay. And really, the, the idea is really just to be able to give students that that place to ask those informal questions, to share those informal comments, have a little record of them. I really like having a record of them because mm-hmm. I can go back and look at it you know, at the end of the class or at the end of the week. Uh, the advantage of that over, let's say, just having kids raise their hand in class mm-hmm. is that I have the record. Mm-hmm. And classmates who perhaps were not in class that day or they just weren't paying attention when their classmate mm-hmm. asked a question, Mm-hmm. they can go back and see the record of it too. And I think in our current COVID-19 setup where half of my students are here on Monday and Wednesday and the other half are here on Tuesday and Thursday, it's going to be really important to have that record so that they're getting some interaction with their classmates that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. Oh, okay. And then the informal assessments, I'm assuming that you're using uh... – um, the NETACAD built-in assessments. What other tool would you recommend for informal assessments? So I'm also a really big fan of having students diagram things. Hmm. Okay. So I like I like Google's Jamboard for this. Oh, okay. Uh, because I can I can let kids sketch or draw the dia- draw a diagram to demonstrate their understanding of a concept uh-huh and i, are we I talking about in a shared jam board or we are talking about individual individual jam board that they share with me oh okay right so every student will create his or her own jam board and they share it with me and so then i can look and see what they see what they've done i actually stumbled on that idea of drawing not not the jam board piece jam board is relatively relatively new but yeah. i stumbled on this idea of more than a decade ago when I was teaching social studies Mm -hmm. and I had a, I had a group of special education students and a lot of them were pretty good at explaining a sequence of events or explaining a concept to me, but they were terrible at writing it out in word format. Okay. So I just had them start to sketch it out literally on paper the first, Mm -hmm. you know, for a couple of years, just not as what, okay, let's see, do you understand this concept? Mm-hmm. And I think that, and that carries over into what I'm doing now. And then again, I have some students who 
are well, let's say they're they're emerging writers. Uh, maybe that's the best yeah. way to say it. Right? Yeah, <laughs> they're emerging writers. So yeah. their writing's not their strong suit, but they have some great technical knowledge. And if they can sketch that out for me in Jamboard, well, great. You know, so how do you make Jamboard, them sketch it? You know, using you know this Lenovo Chromebook and everyone is using these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, with, with Jamboard, you know, they can do it with their they can do it with their mouse. Uh, I'm fortunate that all of our students have touchscreen Chromebooks. Wow. Yep. So we actually have uh, oh, mine's across the across the room right now. Uh, okay. We have. We have Acer touchscreen Chromebooks hmm. that flip all the way around, so they can actually lay them flat and they can Wonderful. sketch on those. I think probably you know that is what um, you know makes you know Jamboard uh, an accessible tool for for uh, devices you know that you have. Um, yeah, but great great suggestion, uh, and also I think a great suggestion for uh, replacing the existing devices also. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would. If you are looking for a new device, I wouldn't necessarily rush out to buy the the Acer Chromebook just on that variable alone, but yeah. it is a nice feature to have. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, I mean, I actually, because when, when I was doing, and um, I'm language arts, so I'm writing intensive. So um, in, in terms of informal assessments, you know, what, um, what I created, you know, was called uh, Learning Loop. Uh, using Google Forms, and um, you know, naturally, Google Form, you know, you use it for quizzes, quizzes, or or assessments. But you know, within that, in the feedback section of Google Forms, and I'm sure you know, you have done uh, a lot of uh, videos on that too. In the feedback, you can embed mini lessons. So, right. based upon the automatic uh, grading, the student getting right or wrong response. So, based upon uh, their response. They are they are guided towards you know the appropriate lesson, appropriate what they call a mini lesson. So that mini lesson is again followed by another assessment within that form. So that create what I call a learning loop, wherein the teacher, even the teacher is not there because the students doesn't have to wait until the next day or the next time you know when they're in front of teacher to get the feedback. Um, so I have used that uh, automatic I mean learning loops to give assessment, uh, lesson, assessment, lesson, and keep it going just like that. It worked pretty well. Yeah, I, 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 I've used Google Forms for, the, for similar things as well. Um, you, know, you can also, for those who are, who are watching or listening, you can also do a similar thing with Microsoft Forms too. Uh, we don't want to leave out the Microsoft people. You can do that with Microsoft Forms as well. Okay, great. So uh, tell me, how long does it take you know, for you to give feedback? Because that is one of uh, the pet peeves of our teachers. Man, it takes a lot of time. It takes so much time to give feedback to students. How long does it take for you, in, with, you with the technology uh, to give meaningful feedback to your students? Well, I, I, you know, that, let, let's, take the, let's take the Jamboard example. Uh, you know, if I have 10 kids who are, who are giving me diagrams and you know, some of them take, you know, will, will create their diagram in five minutes and submit it to me, and others will will be much more detailed, and they'll they'll take thirty five minutes or forty minutes to do it if it, if I let them. Mm -hmm. um, but my my feedback time that I spend on each one of them, I spend five to seven minutes looking at each one of them. You know, depending on what I've given them, I have a you know some key components that I'm looking for. Uh, you know, let's say we're doing a basic, uh, you know, a basic router, you know, basic, basic Wi-Fi setup. You know, I'm, I'm going to look for a couple of, of key components in it. And as long as they can clearly identify those and show me, you know, how, how they come together, you know, I'm happy with that. And I'll say, okay, this is, this is good. We can move on to the next thing. Or I want you to explain something in a little bit more detail. So five to seven minutes for each kid, which, you know, that's an hour, right? That's an hour of my time. If I've got, I think this semester, I'm going to have 12 students on my busiest day. Okay. Uh, or I should say, not my busiest day. In my busiest class, I'll have 12 students at a time. Got it. Yeah. So um, the, the next question, I think, you know, that is related to extending 
the classroom, you know, going beyond the classroom. And one of the research tenets, you know, for online teaching is to create online communities of learners mm -hmm. and uh, for, for, you know, extending discussion, supporting each other. Um, and, uh, you know, that's or what they suggest. So what, um, what application or what platform would you recommend to create um, these safe online communities for students where students can, can continue beyond the school and, you know, after, after hours and, you know, you know, uh, rant about the teachers, rant about, you know, whatever they want to rant about. <laughs> what do you suggest <laughs> they can use uh, it for? What, well, well uh, let me tell you what my students did last spring uh -huh. on their own. And then mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I would recommend. Uh, okay. So I'll tell you first, last spring, my students set up a Discord server mm. uh, this, uh, where th they invited me into. They set okay. that up on their own. I, you know, I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind about extending the classroom through online tools is that you need to have students who are already uh, engaged in your class or already engaged in interacting with each other. Right? Yeah. That, which is why I think it's really important to do a lot of getting to know each other type of activities this year, I think more than any other year. And more than any other, it's always important to get to know your students and to get them to know each other. But I think more than more than ever, that's going to be really, really important this this fall. Uh, and so my students use Discord. Now the trouble with Discord is that there is no monitoring of it other than me, right? Okay. There's no there there is no way for the school to monitor it. There's no way for me to audit what's uh -huh. happening. Uh, you know, if I had a different group of students that were not as, let's just say, engaged in school, it could have gone horribly off the rails. Uh, mm -hmm. I was lucky I had a good group of, good group of kids. Uh, what I'm going to do this fall is I'm going to try to keep it all into Google Classroom and Remind. Mm. Okay. Uh, and just using in Google Classroom, the the announcements and I let students respond to everything in there. Uh, that's where I want to try to keep it. Uh, and re the remind app is also useful because I can send out text reminders to students and have them, you know, reply back. But I think Google classroom, you can, you can do it right in Google classroom. But can they also interact with each other through remind? They can. Okay. They can. And, and, in my school, uh, the teachers have the option to allow students to write back and forth to each other or disable that. And I'm always leaving it turned on so that they can see their classmates' comments and they can reply to their classmates' comments. That's where I'm, that's where I'm trying to keep it. Uh, now, again, if I get a group of kids that I can really trust – and they take the incentive to set up their own group outside of school. There's something I can do. I can't say don't set up this group outside of school, uh -huh. but I'm not going to tell them to set up a group outside of school either. Got it. <laughs> All right. So um, now uh, that brings me to my final question. And that's the question that um, that's a million dollar question. You know, that teachers are uh, um, just getting by. And um, on any given day, financially, I'm talking about, they're not the highest paid professionals in this country. No. Uh, so, um, and I think, you know, you use, you know, the right term for that, um, adupnership. And my question, you know, brings you, uh, I need, you need your help. In getting these people, you know, become financially independent so that they could leave teaching and move and move out of this. <laughs> so, what would you recommend now, in terms of uh, creating some stream of income for these teachers on a daily basis, that you know they can? Uh, but naturally, you know, that means an investment and a commitment 
of, of learning, teaching, or, or, or investing somewhere. So what would you recommend? A couple of things that the teachers can spend their time on and have uh, some, some source of income. So you know, th- th- this, that is a million dollar question. And if I had a million dollar answer, I'd be a millionaire, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but I can tell you, so when I started free technology for teachers now 13 years ago, uh, this was I before did, probably much of technology out there. So I'm sorry, that was before there was much of education technology out there. Yeah, I mean, it was there. it was an emerging, was your was an emerging field. You, you you saw that coming? No, I didn't see it coming. I I, I dumb lucked into that. Uh, I, I I shouldn't say I, I didn't see it coming. I saw a lot of potential. Hmm. Uh, I saw a lot of potential, and and I was looking for an outlet for writing about what I was doing. I I am horribly unorganized in a lot of areas of my life regarding paperwork and keeping track of things. So writing it down and writing blog posts about what I was discovering and doing uh, was a way to organize that. It was two years before I made any money from that. Uh, that was not my initial goal. You know, it was two years before I made any money from that. And it was a very small amount of money from advertising revenue. Uh, so, the, but what I've learned in the ensuing 13 years from that, you know, if you're looking, and I've had, and I had those moments where I was, you know, scraping by when I was, you know, getting to Friday, getting to Thursday night, and I had twenty dollars in my checking account, and you know, we we're hoping that the direct deposit hit on time, right? Uh, I've been there, uh, and who knows? Knock on wood, I might be there again. Um, but what one of the things you, that I think teachers can do if you're looking to create a secondary stream of income is to look at some of the affiliate marketing opportunities that are out there uh, for products you already use. Okay? Uh, you, know, you, you can go to websites like Commission Junkie is, is one of them, uh, or you can even do Amazon, but Amazon doesn't pay all that well. Uh, but look for programs that offer a commission for referring people or an affiliate fee for referring people to the products you already like and use. I think that's the, that way you don't, you're not inventing something new, right? You don't have to create a new product. You just have to refer people to it, to it. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one, one opportunity, uh, you know, or develop, develop something that you can sell on your own. You think about your expertise that you have and, you know, could you create a course? There's websites like teachable that, make it pretty easy to set up an online course where you can teach things that, that you're good at. Uh, and it doesn't have to necessarily be an education related product, right? Uh, you know, there are a lot of teachers who teach from seven to two and have this entire other passion that they would love to pursue, but don't know how to pursue it. Uh, you know, a, a service like teachable would be great for, you know, uh, I'll give you, give you, here's an example I'll give you. So I'm really, as, as we talked about, I'm really into bicycling. I, I love bicycling, uh, love mountain biking. And with COVID-19, I've learned that there's a lot of people that all of a sudden want to buy bikes and get into bicycles. And there's a whole market for people who want to learn how to fix their bikes and repair their bikes. Mm. You can create a teachable class on how to rebuild your bike and do, you know, you know, a five part or a 10 part series about that or a five or 10 part series on fitness. And you can sell that uh, on a service like teachable with again, not having to do a whole lot of uh, technical work or all the, all the, you know, all the, the two year slog that I did before I started making any money. You don't have to do it that, that, that way. Mm. Uh, that, that's where I, that's where I'd start. You know, if I was starting from scratch today, that, that's, that's where I'd start. Uh, you know, and, and think about, you know, just great. I'd say and, really, and, really you know, think about um, your, what, what are you passionate about? Because if you're not passionate about it, it'll just be a, another job. And, and yeah. you don't want that. You, do, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be teaching all day and then think, oh, I've got to do. I think, you know, you're this. bringing us, you know, to that, you know, what they, the term, the, the, the Japanese term they use for uh, ikigai. Uh, you know, if, uh, you know, those, you know, who are not familiar with ikigai, um, if your passion 
uh, is something that you enjoy also uh, gives you the opportunity to, to make some money. That's you are in a state of Ikigai. And I'm sure, um, Richard, by now, you have reached that stage too, your Ikigai. Oh, uh, well, there are days when I, there are days when I, when I, when I, when I have reached that, that stage. Yes. I, uh, I will I, mention what I want to mention one other, since you, since you brought the question of, uh, of earning and earning, earning money. Uh, there's a new book coming out next week uh, called big enough the title is big enough. Mm-hmm. And it's written by Leela fever who founded Common Craft, which I think many teachers are familiar with. CommonCraft.com makes excellent explanatory videos. They do the whiteboard style video uh, about a wide variety of topics in technology and in education. Uh, But the book is all about how to create a small business that is sustainable, not only from the perspective of finance, but sustainable from the perspective of lifestyle. Mm, great. So um, I think um, you you mentioned two books, you know, which um, uh, I will definitely keep you know in mind, and I would like to my audience also to remember. We are talk about you know the expert secrets. That's one, and then big enough. So you know these are uh, two great resources um, to open up our minds, you know, to the opportunities that are out there. Um, but you know, I would at this point I would like you to talk about some of the the, the courses that you have created that you would like, you know, that you think, you know, people can make use of, um, whether they're paid or, or, what, or, or otherwise, it doesn't matter. Well, I, I would say first thing is to go to my YouTube channel. Uh, okay. Search my name, Richard Byrne, and the icon for it, it looks, well, just like me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just me with one of my children in a backpack carrier. Uh, that, that'd, be, that'd be the first thing I'd say. Go, go to my YouTube channel. Uh, and then I do offer some courses. Uh, you can find those at practicaledtech.com. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, so I, I offer a, sorry, a, a motorcycle just went by outside my office window here. Uh, <laughs> so I, I offer, I offer a couple of, couple of courses there. One about using G Suite for education. Uh, another one on, on teaching history with technology. And I'm also doing, I have one uh, coming out on instructional videos and how to make instructional videos. But more importantly, how to get kids to interact with your instructional videos. So that's mm-hmm. go, that'll be coming up uh, in a couple of weeks at practicaledtech.com. But you know, just check out my YouTube channel. I have a thousand, literally a thousand videos there on all kinds of things related to educational technology. Like like I said, you know, Richard earlier that uh, I mean, we cannot thank you enough, you know, for the service, you know, that I think you know you created that phenomena of, you know, free technology for free resources for teachers. And the teachers, you know, uh, should be grateful for all the time that you have uh, invested. Um, and in return, uh, if, if it brings you, you know, some some uh, benefit, uh, I think, you know, you more than, you have more than earned it. So oh, thank you thank very you. much, you know, for, for all of your time. Um, at this point, you know, unless you, know, you have something to share, something to say, um, I will stop the recording and then we can chat. Okay. I, I'm great. I would say the well, last thing I want to say, we, we talked about at the beginning, take care of your mental health. If you're a teacher, the best thing you can do for your students is to take care of yourself. Get out and exercise. Go for a walk. Ride a bike. Go swimming. Whatever it is. Take care of your mental health because if you're not in a good mental state, it's going to impact your classroom in a negative way. So get out there and exercise. I think that's the best closing, you know, we can have, you know, for this conversation.